and welcome back to Nelson All Over Cards. Today, I am talking with Caleb Grace, one of the designers of Lord of the Rings, the living card game, which is one of the games that I play very frequently on the channel, and it's actually probably my favorite out of the three LCGs. How are you doing, Caleb? I'm doing well, thanks. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I said that it used to not be. It, it started with Marvel Champions. I started, I Marvel Champions is the first love. And then mm -hmm. I I was like, I was talking with another one of my friends who has played a lot of the LCGs and kind of got me into Lord of the Rings. I was like, okay. But as I've played more and more Lord of the Rings and kind of as just kind of a disclaimer, I'm playing progression style. And by mm -hmm. the time this video comes out, I should be done with the Ringmaker cycle. Um, depends on how stubborn that last quest is going to be, but that's kind of where I'm at, but kind of right around heirs of Numenor and then the, the Hobbit saga boxes, I was like, mm -hmm. this is, this is the game for me. Cause there's so many like fun things and deck building is just so intense, but that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of where I'm at, but you, uh, you are one of the designers of Lord of the Rings. Uh, kind of kind like of. <laughs> the just just well to be clear yeah Nate French designed the game okay right so if you look at the core box it's just got Nate's name there and uh, and he really deserves all the credit um, I served as like lead designer on the game for almost like nine years you know like a good stretch where I continued to create content for it right so Sometimes people get that mixed up and they'll be like, oh, Caleb was the designer on Lord of the Rings. And we're like, well, it depends on what you're talking about. Because I'm always real careful to give credit where credit's due. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, and Nate's always been very generous uh, with his praise, too. So it's not like it's not like Nate's <laughs> looking over my shoulder and being like, you better give me credit. You know, he's, he's been very generous uh, in, in his praise for my contributions to the line. You know, but there was also, you know, Lucas and MJ and, uh, and, and other people that came on and helped out most recently, Tyler and Jeremy. Um, so yeah, there's been a lot of, a lot of contributors, but I was fortunate to, to be, uh, on that line for a, a pretty long stretch. Yeah. Nine years is a long time. And mm -hmm. so, so just to kind of help me understand, when did you, was there a cycle that you started with or like, where, where did you enter the design team? Yeah, my very first product that I worked on was the very first Hobbit Saga expansion. Nice. Um, it had already begun um, development before I started at the studio. They had uh, uh, Scott Weber did some freelance design for the scenarios. And at the point that I was hired, I kind of took over development of the scenarios. And then I also did all the uh, like initial design for the, you know, the player cards. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that was really, that was really exciting for me to be like hired at FFG. And my first assignment is not only to work on the Lord of the Rings line, but to work on the very first saga expansion, you know, for the Hobbit, which was the first book that I read as a kid and just fell in love with, you know, so that was, that was kind of neat. Yeah. Um, and then the first cycle that I was involved with was the, uh, Heirs of Numenor against the Shadow Cycle. The mean uh, one. Lucas, yeah, Lucas had already, <laughs> pardon me, yeah, Lucas had already completed most of the work. Uh, it was actually very close to um, approvals at the point that I got involved. Um, but then it actually was, like, rejected at the uh, approval step uh, because our, our CEO, Christian Peterson, at the time felt the story was, a little too sprawling it was kind of like all over and he was concerned that uh, you know we were using up too much real estate too soon so he wanted the story to kind of focus in and leave room open for future uh expansions mm. um, but at that time uh lucas was actually uh also transitioning onto netrunner okay um, he would he would end up being in charge of, of bringing that game to market um the, the rebooted Richard Garfield game that, that um, FFG did was like Android Netrunner. Anyway, uh, it just meant that uh, when, when that, um, when Heirs of Numenor was, was uh, rejected with, with notes about, uh, you know, some redesigns they wanted to see, Lucas was unavailable to do them. So that fell to me. 
<laughs> and that was really interesting because I was still pretty new at the company. I, and I didn't have like any playtester friends or anything like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. So one of my first duties was to <laughs> reach out to all the people who had been playtesting that cycle and tell them, uh, sorry, everybody, but the stuff you've been working on for the last couple of months is all kind of being shelved. Oh, no. And we kind of have to <laughs> restart. And they were pretty much all of them like, yeah, I'm out. I'm done. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, no. <laughs> it was a pretty rough initiation. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, we, we, we didn't like have to scrap like all the player cards or anything. It was more about like revising the scenarios and, and kind of rewriting that story a little bit. So we were able to, I think we salvaged maybe three of the nine scenarios. Okay. And, and Lucas was able to help out, uh, even though he was working on that runner, he was able to help out and do a little bit of, uh, scenario design as well. Uh, so really when you think about like the ringmaker cycle that, that you mentioned that, that you've been playing, that was really the first time that I was on a cycle from beginning to end. Nice. Very cool. And that, well, that seems intense. That seems like a, a very, you know, thrown into the deep end introduction to the design team. <laughs> that's FFG. Yeah, that's FFG. <laughs> well, welcome aboard. <laughs> there you go. Nice. Well, okay. So, so you say you were able to salvage like three of those scenarios. Were those for that specific cycle? And then were the other, um, I guess if I can do math, it'd be, it's eight, eight quests in a cycle. Um, there's, there's nine total, right? Nine, there's three in a box, three in a and box, then six packs. Okay. Yeah, and now I'm trying to remember which which ones were which. It's it's kind of tough. I think uh, in, in the in the box, what do you have in the box? Like you you have um, Peril and Pelagir. Yeah, that was one that I designed. Okay, that one that nice. was like a changing. Oh, I remember because uh, this is when Christian first started really getting involved in the stories. He's a huge huge Lord of the Rings fan. And he was a big fan of this game too. And uh, so he he kind of felt strongly that we weren't doing enough with the, the stories, that there was mm. more opportunity to tell some deeper story. Um, and so he actually wrote the narrative. I'm trying to get my, you know, this was so long. This was like a decade ago, <laughs> honestly, at this point and more. Um, but I do believe that was the first box where they started writing the, yeah, the pre was. and post script. Mm-hmm. right um because i remember meetings about how are we going to make sure that people don't read the post script until after they played the scenario and that's where the, the big stop do not read yep. sign came yep. from it's like out of those conversations <laughs> right and the, nice. and the different templating right so like mm-hmm. anyway yeah he actually wrote that he created the character of lord alcaron nice and uh you know had this whole traitor storyline and the black numenorians and and all that it was and so the the peril in, in Pelar gear that was that came out of that story of like, hey, we need to introduce this this message. This person is looking for Faramir. <laughs> and then of course the joke was after we released the Faramir hero, you could start, you know, Peril and Pelagir with Faramir and be like, Hey, I'm right here. <laughs> what you don't have to look for me. <laughs> I, <laughs> just, just give it to it's me. me. It's I'm I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> nice. Were the were the other um six that were not used in that cycle were they used later on down the line and in future cycles ultimately no oh so there's six unreleased unreleased honestly (laughs) i'd be really curious now to find out like what those look like because i can't remember Mm -hmm. um i remember some of the story beats that were rejected but i do not remember the mecha- and they, and it's, it should be really important to say maybe that they weren't rejected for any mechanical reasons. Mm-hmm. Like all all the designs were sound, but I don't I don't remember them very well. Um, I do remember like what we what we came up with instead, because I remember uh, Lucas designed the Morgul Veil. Yeah, which is the that's the last one, right? Yes, that's the one where like faramir has been captured and you have like ten rounds to rescue him. Right, I think there's the objective like to yeah. the tower right yeah. they're dragging him away and i remember him uh talking to me and, and just getting excited going i think i got a, a cool idea like you know three stages three bosses right you know and and the clock is ticking and it and it sounded so 
basic but at the same time like it was really exciting right yeah. like just i think that one's um that one's kind of become a staple mm-hmm. where people really enjoy playing that one over and over because each each stage each boss is memorable and the to the tower thing puts a, a good amount of tension on it so that was fun i just remember being there for the inception of that one and, and being pretty excited yeah no, I and that's one of the things I really enjoy about Lord of the Rings is the the storylines that there that are there. It does very much feel like a you're living a story told in you know the the Tolkien world. Um, well, that that's being, great to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that being said, do you are I assume you are a Tolkien fan if you were excited to be oh, yeah. working on it. Yeah. Okay. So okay this this is this is a kind of random question you said you read the hobbit you really enjoyed the hobbit out of let's say the hobbit and then the trilogy do you have a favorite book oh it's often whatever i'm reading at the That's moment fair. you know um i i definitely like the lord of the rings more than i enjoy the hobbit the hobbit was a thing where i discovered it in the third grade at the school library it was just legit one of those like we're going to the library today and you can pick a book and it had a dragon on the cover so i chose it there and you go. Uh, nice. I, I read it five times, like almost back to back. Um, pardon me, because I didn't know there were more books that came after. Mm-hmm. You know, I was just a kid. <laughs> like it, 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 yeah. I was just like, this world is amazing, and I want to live there. Yeah. And so I just kept reading the book to stay immersed. And then, uh, then my uncle told me like there were more books, and <laughs> my mind just exploded. <laughs> so nice. I think I was in like the sixth grade, you know, when I read yeah. the, the Lord of the Rings for the first time. And I remember because, you know, uh, summer vacation, you know, I would always be outside playing. And that summer I was like inside reading these books because I couldn't put them down, you know. So, uh, yeah, they're, they're really kind of my first loves. And nice. uh, I've never lost interest in them. Uh, so I felt so fortunate. I thought what an interesting uh, life journey that my uh, ob- obsessive fandom turned into like a, a job skill, like a job asset where uh, I kind of became the Lord of the Rings guy at the studio for, for those nine years where people had questions about the lore or, or anything they would ask me, you know? Um, and it was funny too, because a lot of people came to the, to the story through the movies. Yeah. And so they'd often get that mixed up sometimes of like what happened in the book what versus what happened. And so I, I kind of have to be the guy to like, you know, actually, you know, <laughs> you know like, <laughs> <laughs> kind of do that from time to time yeah um, yeah <laughs> nice <laughs> and so so we just currently we're in a phase of repackaging some of the content so the game has been mm-hmm. around for nearly a decade or actually probably about more. a decade now yeah more i think it released in 2010 oh, that's so crazy that's so exciting it's it's been on the market now for 13 years wow that's awesome yeah and so now um, Fantasy Flight Games is going through a repackaging, and it's not really any new content. I have a couple of videos out talking about that, but there mm-hmm. we're we're I'm part of it now. Apparently, uh, hey, well, you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get thrown into the deep end. Apparently, I'm excited That's to right. see what, what the first task is. Take a swim, buddy. <laughs> um, it, it's getting repackaged, and one of the products that just got repackaged was one of the the Fellowship of the Rings saga box, which mm-hmm. follows the events of Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. So this this may be an unfair question, and to which I say sorry. But do you prefer the saga or the the yes. cycle? Oh, the okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. not a hard question <laughs> for me. Um, I mean, I have I have incredible love for the entire line and everything in it. But the uh, the Lord of the Rings saga expansions are very near and dear mm. to me, and always will be, uh, because as I said, like that's my favorite book series, yeah, uh, bar none. Nothing else even comes close. And, uh, you know, all of those characters were like family members I grew up with, you know. And uh, so having the opportunity to to create that uh, story in the game Mm -hmm. was just a a huge opportunity and and a big responsibility, too. Yeah. So um, I remember starting it was uh, Christian Peterson. I mentioned a big Lord of the Rings fan. He actually took me to coffee. He was like, let's go talk about this thing. Cause he had some ideas for how he wanted to execute these, this saga line. 
Um, and one of the big things was, you know, a campaign mode that did mm -hmm. not exist in Lord of the Rings prior to the Lord of the Rings saga expansions. You know, this idea that your uh, outcomes in the previous scenario would carry over to the next one. And then as we released each box, you know, it, your, your results would carry with you from product to product. You know, that was, that was a big deal because, you know, there was never a guarantee at the start that we'd be able to get all the way to the finish. Um, but we, we talked about boons and burdens and, you know, how choices that you make in the game would matter and hero death would be permanent and all of these things. And after that, I went back to my desk and uh, I created this document that uh it, it outlined the entire thing like all the adventures there was you know there's three scenarios in each box and each box is uh one book you know for for those diehard Tolkien fans they know that the Lord of the Rings is actually six books right mm -hmm. um because each of the novels is broken into two books and so each book was getting three scenarios and so I would list the chapters of each book and then I would look at, okay, what are the adventures to tell from those chapters? And then from there, I would go, okay, what are going to be the mechanics for each of those scenarios? What's going to be the hook? And then from there, it would be, okay, what's at stake as far as campaign mode? Like, what are the, what are the boons you can earn and what are the burdens? And some are very obvious, right? Like uh, in the book, when you get to Rivendell, you know, that's where Frodo picks up a mithril shirt and sting um aragorn's sword is is reforged that's a big difference from the movie right is you know aragorn left rivendell with andoral um and so you, you had these really iconic things and so you know that when you're when you're um playing that chapter those are going to be your boons right some of the burdens were real obvious too you know like frodo getting stabbed in the shoulder by the witch king and that wound never fully healed mm -hmm. So you knew that was going to be a burden that was going to follow you. And then some would be choices. So that was really exciting to create that document. It was also kind of crazy to like draft it all up and then realize like I'm looking at, you know, like four years or more <laughs> worth of work. Yeah. You know, uh, and, and it, it all depends on the success of each release. Yeah. So when we actually got all the way to the Mountain of Fire expansion, I mean, that was just that was really an incredible feeling. Um, and again, Christian kind of pulled me aside after it was done and said some, one of, I, probably one of the biggest compliments in my career. He just said, you know, you've created something now that exists among the pantheon of Lord of the Rings games. It'll be there yeah. forever. Yeah. I was like, that's pretty cool. Hadn't really thought about it, but once he put it in that context, I'm like, I'm exceptionally proud. Yeah. Um, got a lot of positive feedback. I remember at the release of the Black Riders, the very first, you know, of the saga boxes, the reception was just amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, people just, uh, to this day, they still recommend that to a lot of new players. They're like, Hey, if, you, if you're a big fan of the books, you're just starting the game, start with this one. You know, I love seeing that people talk about how much fun it was to play the hobbits and, oh, I love the hobbits. and play through the story. Yeah. So in, incredibly proud. Yeah. Of all that. So the very easy question for me to answer. <laughs> fair, very fair. Yeah. No, I, when I made the decision that I was going to be playing Lord of the Rings and playing them on stream, I had, it was a hard restraint to not dive directly into the saga stuff, just because mm -hmm. I do love that lore so much, but I'm like, I'm going to, mm -hmm. I'm going to play a progression. And even to the point that it's like, I've played the black Riders, but I have not, you know, played any of the other saga and that comes next. And so it's just like, I, I'm like, it's always, it's almost like a treat. Like I'm like, Ooh, mm -hmm. I get to get to it. But <laughs> it also, when yeah. I started the black riders, it sparked the whole reread of the Lord of the Rings. And so, <laughs> so yeah. we'll see if that happens again. And so it's a, it's yeah, there's such great products and I absolutely love them. I have heard uh, some cautionary tales about some of those last quest in the, uh, in the the saga cycles they they tend and the to be the final ones they tend to be a little difficult as far as i understand well yeah i i think <laughs> when you are marching on the black gate of mordor <laughs> itself it should be difficult or when you're trying to you know climb up the hills of oradruin and you know and cast the ring you know into yeah. mount doom that that should be difficult oh 100 uh, 
yeah i mean the greater sin would be getting to the end of the saga and be like well that was easy <laughs> yeah <laughs> yep <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, uh, in in real fairness, uh, I never set out to make any of them just ball breakingly hard mm, and frustrating. Mm-hmm. You know, um, something that I was very careful to do was to play test all of them with just the saga content, mm, right? Mm-hmm. Like one core set and one copy of each box, and okay. and so there's deck lists in each box that can be built with just content from the sagas. Um, that was really important. And so we would play test even those bonkers scenarios at the end using the deck list provided, you know, to show yeah. like, hey, this is possible to win. And for sure, you will have a good time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that last one actually was was really unique, the Mountain of Fire, because I was thinking about, so Flame of the West, the prior box has the, the Battle of the Pelnor Fields which is the culmination of a lot of different saga content. There's, there's a scenario in the previous box um, where Sam and Frodo meet Faramir and his rangers, and there's the battle with the Southrons coming up the road. And you're told to like record every Southron that you know continues on the road that you fail to ambush. And it has nothing to do with that box. You know, you're just told to write it down. And yep. you're like, what's that for? <laughs> and then you get to the Battle of the Pelennor Fields. That's really cool. And when you get to a certain stage where the Southrons arrive, every Southron enemy that you failed to defeat on the road appears at the Battle of the Pelennor Fields. That's so cool. And yeah, it was. <laughs> and there was some other things too. Like there's a scenario where Aragorn's trying to get through the Passage of the Dead. And... Uh, you know, for every turn that it takes you to defeat that scenario, you know, um, then that's, you have to wait that long for Aragorn to arrive at the Battle of Pelennor Fields. That's amazing. So this was like, I was so happy with how that one came together, pulled all these threads together, felt like my master plan really kicked off. But then you realize there's still another box and somehow it has to top this, (laughs) right? Yep. Because if the Battle of the Pelennor Fields is the high mark of the whole thing, that means that the last box, the what should be the climax, is a bit of a letdown. So we had to sit on that one for a while. But fortunately, like I said, we outlined all this in advance. And I remember um, years before we actually did it, pitching the idea that the last two scenarios should be playable side by side, mm. simultaneously. Oh, you know? interesting. Yeah. That you would split the players up to re- you know to replicate what's happening yeah. in the books this is where the aragorn and the frodo storylines merge and so aragorn's leading the army against the black gate and that's one scenario and then at the same time frodo and sam are tiptoeing toward mount doom and that's the other scenario and they're happening simultaneously and the goal of the aragorn player is to draw the eye of sauron away so that frodo and sam can advance and i remember pitching that like I said, years before, and and the reaction from the executives was like, if you can pull that off, that will be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and it was great because in the interim, in the interim, we used to do all these Gen Con and, and mm-hmm. fellowship events, mm-hmm. special scenarios. Yeah. And so we came up with one, you know, um, the Siege of Anuminos was this epic multiplayer event where the idea was let's design a scenario specifically for a large group and let's get them working with each other. So we actually developed Epic multiplayer mode in advance of that final box. So by the time we got to the final box, we're like, well, of course we know how to do it. We've already done it once before. That's awesome. Uh, So that was, yeah, that was really rewarding to see people's reaction to Holy smokes, you can do what now, you know? (laughs) And then, and then the fact that it still works in solo. Right. Yeah. You can still play the Black Gate and just record how many turns that you survive because you can't win. Yeah. <laughs> you, just, <laughs> you just survive. Yep. Yep. yep and yep. then you have that many turns to to destroy the ring in the final scenario. That's so cool. Oh my goodness. I'm so pumped to get there now. It's yeah, a, thank you. It's a little bit further down the line, but it'll happen soon. Well, any I'm... anytime I talk about it. Yeah. I always feel compelled to share this story because it's one of yeah. my favorite playtesting stories. Um, 
So apologies to anyone who's listened to this interview who's heard me talk about it before, but I'm going to tell it again. Uh, we were playtesting that that multiplayer event, and we had four players at the Black Gate and two players trying to destroy the ring per the instructions. And uh, the the thing with the un, unwinnable scenario at the Black Gate is you you reveal extra uh, encounters every turn, mm. right? So turn one is plus one, turn two is plus two, plus three, plus four. It just keeps getting more. It's like turn seven, you're revealing seven encounter cards. It's <laughs> insane. Like you're going to lose at some point. And, yeah. and the whole idea is just to survive. So we're just, we survived this brutal round and we look to a, the Sam and Frodo players and I'm like, please tell us that you're like almost there. Like tell us you advanced to the next stage. And they're like, no, nah, we did a side quest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> they're like yeah we did gather information and my buddy's laughing it's like yeah it's sort of like sam and frodo were tiptoeing along and then they saw hey look scenic overlook one mile <laughs> let's go check that out <laughs> well all their friends are just like you know getting destroyed outside. <laughs> just getting crushed yeah and they're like huh look at that <laughs> no! we did win though Nice, they, nice. They used, yeah, they they got the right cards and 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 they sealed the deal. So they got the right information. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, that's amazing. So okay, so that's actually one of the things that I was curious about test or talking to you about, and that is the you have multiplayer settings. I do think that the game works better in a multiplayer like table. That being said, as I've played through progression style, I've noticed that it's gotten a little bit friendlier to solo players. Was that a conscious decision? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a, a bit of context. This is not an easy question to answer because you need a little bit of context. <laughs> like when Nate designed the Lord of the Rings, um, to the best of our knowledge, there was no other fully customizable fully cooperative one to four player narrative quest driven game in existence you know like it's a very rare bird uh that actually you know paved the way for arkham horror and marvel champions you know really carved out its own niche um and so just the amount of of ingenuity and creativity that went into creating basically a new genre it's just incredible. Um, and with that comes a whole bunch of lessons that no one's learned before, you know? So you can kind of tell, like, with that first wave, there was an emphasis on multiplayer. You know, people have repeatedly said that, you know, two player is the sweet spot, you know, two or three players. Some of those scenarios obviously became easier the more players you added. You know, when you look at the core set and, uh, the the scenario everyone remembers you know is the second one the journey down the anduin because that hill troll is so memorable when you're playing solo that's just <laughs> terrifying it right because you know it's coming after you and you've got to <laughs> find a way to deal with it on your own and i lost to that scenario at least a half dozen if not a dozen times before i ever won uh i remember like celebrating that victory like just fist pumping <laughs> to, like myself and no one else around just cheering because, you know, it took some work. But when you add, like, even one more player with some ranged or sentinel, boy, it becomes a lot easier, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the fi the final scenario, of course, is notorious. The <laughs> You know, because you, you, someone's losing a hero and they're being captured in, you know, Escape from Dol Guldur. And, uh, again, in Solo, that's devastating. You got to win somehow with just two heroes. <laughs> but in four-player, it's like, eh. You know, what's right. one of 12, right? So, yes, there there was early on, you know, you're creating a whole new game type. Not everything's going to be perfectly balanced. Uh, but just the ingenuity, the creativity was was already so abundant. Um, so as we, yeah, as we worked on it, we, we, we gained experience from uh, player uh, feedback, reactions to it. And we saw, we kind of shifted over time to the point where the game became harder in multiplayer, <laughs> which wasn't necessarily our intent to the degree that it happened. I think we were consciously trying to make it harder at the higher player counts so that people would have to work together and, we, and it would balance out. Mm -hmm. 
And I think sometimes, you know, uh, we overdid it where it was like in counter decks, like everything would just combo, everything would just <laughs> pop up, everything would surge. And like people would just get overwhelmed at that four player count where it's like, that's maybe not <laughs> what we were going for. But definitely we were trying to make things more reasonable for solo players to, to feel like they had more of a fighting chance. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there definitely was a change over time of like, it used to be like really hard for solo players and that changed, it became harder for like multiplayer. Um, you know, we just continued to, to experiment and develop as we went on. And I think, um, I think we eventually figured it out, you know, probably around the Angmar Awaken cycle is where I feel like we really knew what we were doing for sure. Cause that was, that was, like I said, that would have been my second full cycle that I was on from start to finish, you know? So I learned a lot of lessons from the Ringmaker cycle that I was able to carry forward. It was also the time when MJ uh, really became like a full-time member of the of the team where MJ was originally doing like nightmare stuff and kind of contributing here and there. The Angmar Awaken cycle is really more of like where MJ and I started sharing responsibility uh, for the line proper. Mm. Um, because there was kind of a handoff that happened where I did the box, the, uh, oh gosh, what's the box called? For the Angmar Awaken? I'm turning <laughs> around and look at it. The Lost Realm. Yes. The Lost Realm. I did the box and the first pack of the scenario, and then MJ did the rest. So that was a really fun one for me because I really liked working that close with MJ, very creative uh, person. Um, so from there i was more like the saga line and mj was more like in charge of the uh the cycles uh by by taking over the angmar cycle and then doing the dream chaser cycle um that kind of freed me up to to finish the saga expansions nice yeah so so angmar is the next cycle that i'm going into in my progression mm -hmm. series so do you have any words of advice or or things to things to be aware of for me and it's also the first full cycle to get repackaged in mm -hmm. the in the repackaged initiative that we are working mm -hmm. on together um, <laughs> 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 um so also advice to players that may be picking up the first cycle for for the first time oh sure well it is it's a challenging one that's for sure but i think with that, you know, we included some deck lists to make some some really good, strong cool. player decks. Um, so maybe my advice to players would be find the deck that fits your play style. Because mm. we do have those starter decks out there. Um, so, you know, presumably if you're playing Angmar, that means you've got the core set. And we put some deck lists in the core set for you can make some some pretty solid decks out of just one core now with the repackage. Um, or you can also get one of the four starter decks that we made. And those are products I'm really proud of because they we they did not exist in the initial run. Mm -hmm. They are products that we made strictly for the repackaged um, push. Uh, so you have a Dwarf starter, a Sylvan starter, pardon me, uh, Rohan and Gondor are the other two. And each one has its own play style. And, uh, and then, of course, if you're picking up the Angmar Awaken um, scenarios, then maybe you want the Angmar um, player card box as well, which comes with a lot of Dunedain and some Noldor and, and some other good stuff and some deck lists in there as well. So I, I would say, like, Dunedain has a very specific play style that's, that's different from others because they want enemies engaged with them. Most people either don't want the enemies or they want to engage them and defeat them immediately so they don't have to see them again. <laughs> and the Dunedain are kind of different. They're like the hunters. They're going to go and find them and they're going to pull them down and they might actually keep them around for a little bit to power up all their abilities, which that play style is not necessarily going to suit everybody. Mm -hmm. So some people might just want to, if you just want to like spam allies and build up a big army uh, so that you can just like steamroll over the quest, then you probably want to pick up like the dwarf starter, you know? Um, 
or you know if you if you want to do more tricks like you know questing without exhausting or or preventing enemies from attacking then you might like the sylvans as they bounce in and out of play and allow you to do a lot of really fun things so i think for new players yeah it's like find the the play style that sounds exciting and fun to you and then bring that to to the quest nice yeah i i did not pick up any of the starter packs just because i wanted to get through to them but i just mm -hmm. played my first I would say functional Sylvan deck and oh my mm -hmm. goodness, I had so much fun with that. So many fun decisions bouncing in and out and it was, it was, it was an absolute blast to play. So I'm oh, probably, to hear. yeah, I'm probably taking that up against uh, the antler crown in a couple awesome. of days. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great to hear. That was, um, I'm really proud of the Sylvans because I, I did some, like I said, I did some initial design for the Hobbit, where I, I came up with the player cards there, and, and you know the the dwarves were already kind of established as an archetype in the game. You know, from the very first cycle, you had Dane Ironfoot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just making every dwarf character stronger. Um, so I was trying to like come up with like, well, how how is Thorin and his company like any different? You know, uh, and so they kind of had their thing of like, well, as long as you have a certain number of dwarves in play, they they really work better as a team. Mm -hmm. um but that didn't really set them apart from dane and his dwarves they all just kind of worked together um so it wasn't really until the ring oh, sorry not ringmaker yeah no ringmaker it wasn't until that wave that i got to create a a faction from the ground up you know nice. to, yeah. to envision for myself yeah. like okay how does sylvans work because we have some sylvans in the game already but not enough that they are an archetype onto themselves yet and so, yeah, I was just able to kind of mine my my love of the the lore and think about how they're they're really secretive people, and you know they kind of do these hit and run style raids on their borders, and uh, yeah, so I I really like that idea. Of, and, and again, it was also like we already have dwarves who just want to play more dwarves. What can we do yeah. that's different, right? But also feels you know strong. Uh, so yeah, I'm really glad that it still holds up today because I know it resonated at the time that it came out. People were very excited. Yeah, it's a ton of fun. And one of the things I really do appreciate about the design is that it does feel different. The Sylvans feel different from the Dwarves, which feel different than the Hobbits. And it feels like you can have almost a completely different experience against the exact same quest, depending mm -hmm. on what, how you're approaching it. And one of my favorite things to do is figure out What's the puzzle piece that I need to put in to approach this quest? And because some of them out there are pretty tough and it's always kind of fun to, you almost feel like a, okay, throw, throw the hobbits. It's like, that didn't work. Let's try the dwarfs. Let's see if the dwarfs can, can infiltrate. And so it's just fun because it does feel like you're providing a very different play style. Well, that's great to hear. Yeah, that was, that was definitely the goal. And I felt really good about that once I was able to start you know, contributing to those more like core level designs. Um, that was always a highlight for me of, of every wave would be like, what's the new, what's the new faction that we're going to really try to develop in this wave. And then again, mining the lore uh, to, to make them feel authentic to the books. So like, you know, with the Dunedain being the, the hunters, the rangers that are actually out there actively protecting the Shire and, and making sure that evil creatures don't, slip through their defenses and uh the hobbits were were also especially fun because it was like how do you represent hobbits yeah. in this game where there's such a uh an interesting set of characters where they seem so unintimidating at first and yet they always rise to the occasion <laughs> um so the 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 react the fan reaction to hobbits was another like career highlight as people really enjoyed playing them right out of the black riders that was nice cool. nice yeah. and, and then mj did a great job with like the noldor yeah and then what came after that was like uh i think dale we introduced dale as a playable faction and we, we really built up gondor some more to kind of take them in a slightly different direction with like mm. uh the valor keyword that mj came up with and yeah 
Nice. Yeah, and so each cycle has a a, a faction or two that they're kind of supporting. Mm -hmm. But also one of the other things that I've noticed playing through is that there's a new, maybe not every single time, but it feels like there's a new mechanic kind of added to, like, we got the time mechanic, we got the doomed mechanic, we got... So uh, the siege and the battle mechanic for questing mm -hmm. was that a was that a conscious decision to try and add something new each cycle or or what was the design thought around some of those? Yeah, well, that's kind of an interesting story too. Like we were talking about the whole sink or swim, like you know, you just throw it <laughs> into the deep end. Yep. You kind of just learn from watching what the person in front of you is doing, and so, like I said, at the time that I joined, uh, Lucas was serving as the lead uh, designer on Lord of the Rings. And then that was sort of transitioning to me as he was moving on to, you know, Netrunner. Um, and so I'm watching what he's doing and he's created, yeah, for, for the, uh, against the shadow cycle is very Gondorian themed, you know, right on the border with Mordor. And so you know, he wanted to represent, you know, this ongoing struggle, this kind of, open warfare between these two uh, rivals. And so, yeah, he came up with the siege and battle keywords as a, a different way of questing. Um, and, and so that, as I'm brand new to this job and I've never done game design before, I'm watching that going, okay, so every wave or cycle should have some new hook, some new mechanic, you know? And, and so, uh, with the Ringmaker cycle, pardon me, I, I kind of looked at the feedback we were getting from players at the time, and it, you wouldn't believe it, but, you know, at the time, some, some players are like, well, the game's too easy. You know, they, they crack the code. They're like, you just, uh, you, you reduce your threat as far as you can, draw lots and lots of cards, and build up your board state, and then you just steamroll the quest. It's, it's right? only it three like, things. That's how... <laughs> well, it, it wasn't actually that hard to do. I remember uh, my older brother was playing the game quite a bit at the time, and he had a deck with, like, Barovor and Aon, and he would just put, like, every unexpected courage on Barovor and dress, draw, like, you know, maybe four or six extra cards every turn. And then with Aon and access to Spirit, you know, would just, like, reduce threat with Galadrim's Greeting and, and literally just wait till he'd just sit at stage one of the quest and not even worry about what's going on until he had like <laughs> all of his allies on the table <laughs> and then the rest of the scenario was a breeze and so people were kind of complaining like hey we, we think we've cracked the code and i thought okay threat was supposed to be the thing that prompted you to get moving mm -hmm. that was supposed to be the timer but it was too easy to reduce your threat so i thought well let's introduce something else to serve as a timer and mm -hmm. and i got really creative and i called the timer time <laughs> <You know? laughs> yep. the time keyword yep <laughs> and it was just this idea of like we're trying to tell these stories where something is going mm -hmm. on and you're in a hurry so let's just represent the passage of time and uh and i think i think it worked to a point and then i think i overdid it mm. because i remember mj coming on board around that time and saying, are you sure you want time in like every one of these scenarios? And again, I was just going off of like what would have been modeled for me coming in. It yeah. was like, yeah, that's the gimmick for this cycle. <laughs> so it's, it's everywhere. Um, Cause we ended up using time, the keyword in later cycles, mm -hmm. but very sparingly. And we found that when you use it sparingly, people actually kind of dig it. Yeah, it's when it's everywhere all the time in your face that it can become a little burdensome, you know, and so that's one of those things I look back and I go, well, I'm really glad people stuck with me as I was learning <laughs> the ropes, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, that was that was kind of like, so to answer your question, like, yes and no, there was a kind of like a discussion of what's new. To this cycle but as we went on we tried to make it a little less like in your face mm -hmm. so like my favorite one is the side quest yeah, okay. from from Agmar. yeah because that to me just felt like the most natural and even though we put side quests in every single scenario in that wave it, it never felt 
burdensome. It never felt like, oh, we're just tired of this. This is so right. annoying. Because each scenario kind of used them differently. And, and some of them, they may or may not even show up, mm -hmm. you know. And I felt like after that cycle, we continued to use side quests and people continued to be excited to, to see them. So that was probably the most successful one. But then after that, yeah, we kind of toned it down to where like in the Dream Chaser, you know, you have ships and you're sailing, but you're not sailing in every single scenario because mm -hmm. some of them take place on an island, you know, and so you don't need the sailing mechanic. And then that scenario would have its own thing. Um, so, yeah, we kind of learned as we went to be more uh, sensitive to like <laughs> more strategic, maybe. But how are we using these things? Right. That makes which uh, which I think is a is a nice bridge into my final question that i have and that is kind of like what was the biggest or the 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 biggest lesson or the biggest takeaway that you have from designing this game for so long oh wow <laughs> <laughs> i don't i don't know that's that's a good one <laughs> um the biggest lesson jeez i'm sure i learned more than one <laughs> like yeah, nine years on, on a line and <laughs> interacting with different designers and playtesters and fans throughout that whole time, I learned a lot of lessons. So it would be hard to say, like, what's the biggest one? The, the, the thing that comes to mind for me is probably just the what we what we took from it that we applied to Marvel Champions then, you know, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I would go back and do Lord of the Rings differently because they're different IPs and they're different mm -hmm. games and they each have a different focus. So Lord of the Rings was always, you know, its reputation is that it's hard, you know, and that's appropriate for that line because all the stories are, are the ones where it seems like the heroes are going to lose. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's a miracle when, when they win, you know, so in order to, immerse you in the lore and replicate that feeling the scenarios have to be hard yeah and and then it allows you to feel so triumphant when you win so what we did when we went uh, from lord of the rings to marvel champions was like well this is a very different ip mm -hmm. you know people want to feel heroic so we sort of embraced that sense of empowerment okay yeah so lord of the yeah. rings is all like how are we going to get out of this and then champions became watch me do this <laughs> nice you know? yeah yeah and i will say though that people have resonated with that feeling of empowerment mm. and uh so for me personally just on my own personal journey as a designer i took that with me to um to the star wars deck building game that yeah. i made was again like let's let's try to capture that feeling of empowerment let's make stuff that's really exciting and and um, and so that was something I think MJ was always pretty good at working on Lord of the Rings, even that that um, I I would need prompting sometimes to make bigger, splashier player card effects. OK, you know, to yeah, because I was always worried about making that card that was just too good that it was going to break the game because there there were some of those already by the time that I <laughs> that I took over uh, that we had to find creative ways to deal with, you know, because you when you don't have a live opponent sitting across from you to respond mm -hmm. to what you're doing, when everything's scripted, one card can, can just break a game where yep. everything becomes trivialized. Yep. Um, so I was always like, you know, aim small, miss small, like I'm going to make fun, exciting cards, but I'm not going to make them too powerful. And sometimes um, I think that would frustrate players that they're like, Hey, we need, we need something more, mm -hmm. you know, something we can really build around, something we can get excited by. And so that was a lesson I learned, too, was like, you know, try to find ways to swing for the fences a little more. Yeah. Um, and you could definitely see that carried over into Champions, where you just have, like, bonkers of, uh, abilities. <laughs> um, but I tried, I tried to bring some of that to Lord of the Rings toward the end, too, where, like, I think one of my favorite cards is the Free Peoples. Okay. I don't know if you've seen this card or not. Uh, it's in the Haradrim cycle, I believe. Okay. And it is a, uh, it's five cost neutral event. Okay. So there was sort of a history in Lord of the Rings of like five cost events, you know, like Grim Resolve, like yep. being a big, like ready everybody. 
And so I wanted to make this uh, neutral. Obviously means you can play it much easier than a Grim Resolve, uh, theoretically. Um, and what it does, it, it's got this caveat. It says you have to have nine different traits on your characters. <laughs> okay. Play, okay. Right? Yeah. Because it's the representing you're bringing all the free peoples together, right? So nine different traits. So if you have nine different traits, you can play this five cost event to ready all of your characters and they all get plus one to their stats, like till the end of the, the round, I think. That's crazy. It's been a while since I looked at it now. I, I can't remember. It's, maybe it's just willpower. Maybe it's to all their stats. But yeah, it's like this big... Um, but but that, that caveat there, I think, is what to help keep it grounded. And so I, I started looking for more stuff like that. You yeah. Know, trying to do... That was a lesson I was really trying to apply at the end. Or like the Sylvan got a card in one of the later cycles, too. Um, or it's the host of the Galadrim. It's another neutral event. Okay. I believe. Uh, and it, what it lets you do is it just it's it, it's like four costs. It lets you pick up all your Sylvan allies, <laughs> return them to your hand, and then play them all back for free. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what it does. You just pick them up and you put them back down. But you know, obviously, if you're running a Sylvan deck with like Celeborn yeah. or Galadriel, you know, now they're all getting stat boosted and questing without exhausting and they're triggering all their enters play abilities and so yeah that was definitely a lesson that i learned that uh that i was grateful for you know that, yeah that toward the end started to make these cards that you know were were big and splashy but you know without breaking the game yeah and, and like those, those to me feel like something that we had discussed previously and a video or I don't actually remember when we just talked about it, but uh, of like these like moments that you can look back to and mm -hmm. like say like that and you remember it and you talk about it. And like that to me feels like that card that's going to, you know, change the game state so much that it's like, remember when that happened and yeah. like everything changed and it, it, it gives players these like good feelings and, you know, mm -hmm. memories, which is what this game is what are this games like these do and they, they create mm -hmm. lasting memories um, solo or with multiplayer with friends and just these epic moments that people can look back on. And it feels like those types of cards are definitely that. Yeah. It's, it's so cool to, as you say that I realized like you, you reminded me of, of probably the biggest lesson that I did learn <laughs> and it, it is connected to what I was talking about, but it was, I think early on, I was I was so concerned with um, just coming up with clever designs, you know, um, telling telling stories through card effects. I think I've always been pretty good at that of of just creating scenarios that feel like the story they're trying to tell, mm -hmm. the, creating that immersive feeling. I feel like I've always been pretty good at that, but um, I think for a long time my focus was very much on on being clever. Like I've heard musicians talk about it, where. Um, you have these really talented musicians that write songs for other musicians to impress other musicians. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you have, you have musicians that write pop hits that people love and, and love to play and hear on the radio. And then you have some musicians that write songs that aren't necessarily radio friendly. They're just meant to show off their skills and impress yeah. other musicians. And I think I was maybe too concerned for a while with like, being clever and you know showing oh look what a smart designer i am when the reality is like exactly what you said what people want is a memorable experience you know they want that um they want that song that they love to hear on the radio that they can sing along to it's not to say you're not dumbing it down any but you just it's where's your focus am i trying yeah. to impress people with how intricate these designs are and how this card works with that card and all that or am I trying to give people something, moments, memorable moments like what you talked about? Um, yeah, I really like the way you said it because it just reminded me that that was something that I kind of learned partway through. That I, Again, I think MJ always had a really good sense of that, of, of this is what people are going to remember when they play this, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, and, and so for me, it was, it was always more like I'd look at the thing as a whole, like, like building a a watch and like putting all the pieces together and being like, see, look, it works, you know, <laughs> yeah. but that's not necessarily like, wow, that made me feel something. So right. I, yeah. I definitely, as it went on, I tried to shift focus from, you know, 
less worried about how clever am I being and more about what is this evoking from the people who are playing it? Yeah. You know, where's the, where's the wow moment in this quest? You know? That's really cool. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That, that's well, a, I'm glad that... you jogged my memory on that. Honestly, <laughs> it's just, uh, yeah, it's funny. That was something I, I remember thinking to myself one day. I was like, I should probably should write this down. <laughs> And now it's codified in video format. So there you go. There you go. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I just want to thank you again for coming on, taking time out of your day to talk with me about Lord of the Rings, one of my favorite games of all time. I really do appreciate you taking time. Do you have anything that you want to plug, talk about before we sign off today? Um, You know, I'm just really happy that I got to be part of the Lord of the Rings for so long. Like, honestly, what a what a treat like most card games don't survive yeah. that long let alone uh have the same designer on it for that long that was that was just really cool the community for it's always been terrific uh and very supportive uh bearing with me as i learned some of these lessons you know and always seen the best in it uh so i'm incredibly grateful for that and to all my play testers who you know are my friends now i made some really great friendships through those uh, those experiences and I, I got to say, I'm just, I'm so pleased with uh, how successful the, the repackaged effort has been um, because that was something that, that I really advocated for for mm. a long time, you know, for a while as, as we were winding down the game's initial run, there was some rumblings of a, should there be a second edition or, you know, what should we do? And ultimately I, I pushed against that pretty hard because I thought, I'm really proud of what we've done. You know, um, I love hearing, you know, yourself and others talk about how they're still discovering the Sylvans or playing through the Saga expansion for the first time. And I, and I feel like they hold up. And uh, so it's really rewarding to hear that and also to see how many new players are still coming to the game. Um, it's a real big deal to me to just be part of that legacy, you yeah. know, to, to be a part of it. So I, I'm really grateful to everyone, you know, who played the game in its first iteration and, and now to everybody who's picking up the repackaged stuff. Um, and there's, yeah, there's still a little more to come to look forward. I think Dream Chaser has just been announced. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I'm pretty sure that our, our studio head had announced, you know, uh, a while ago, you know, that that wouldn't be the last one. Mm -hmm. So excited for people to to rediscover or discover for the first time some of these amazing products yeah yeah and and that's what they are they are amazing products and so oh, thank you i i'm excited for people to experience them one of the things that i have enjoyed through the progression is that now with like uh fellowship or the repackage i people are starting to play content that i've that i have already played and so kind of like being on the other side of the table that you have been on for nine years and seeing people experience the game for the first time feels like a, it, it's fun for me. And I can't imagine how rewarding that is for you. So it's very cool. Yeah. Especially too, to see um, like the community just keeps growing. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, like it, it didn't even break stride when, when we had the, the little space uh, interim between, the end of the Mordor cycle and the beginning of the relaunch. It was like, people just kept it going. Um, there's some really great fan driven conventions and uh, I've had the good fortune to attend those and they're always sold out and they're always getting too big for the space they're in. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so it's just, it's exciting to think where this could continue to go from here. It's an exciting thought. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Well, thank you again for coming on. I appreciate it. And until next time, hope you have a fantastic yeah. rest of your day. See you around. Peace. Thanks for having me. Yeah.